Good morning and thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Tina Thibault and I'm the Director of Media Relations for the Province of Nova Scotia. I will be your moderator for this morning's news conference. Joining us today are the Honourable Randy Delory, Minister of Health for the Province of Nova Scotia. The Honourable Stephen McNeil, Premier of Nova Scotia. Dr. Robert Strang, Chief Medical Officer of Health, the Nova Scotia Department of Health and Wellness. And Gaynor Watson Creed, Deputy Chief Medical Officer of Health for Nova Scotia. Please note that this morning's news conference is being live streamed. Both Premier McNeil and Dr. Strang will have a few words to say before the question and answer portion of this news conference. The question and answer portion of this news conference is for media only. Again, we will take questions from the room first and then we will take questions from reporters joining us from the teleconference line. We have allotted approximately 30 minutes for the question and answer portion of this news conference. I'd now invite Premier McNeil to say a few words. Uh, thank you and good morning, uh, everyone. Nova Scotia has been fortunate uh, not to have any uh, cases of COVID-19 in the province to date. However, the reality is we expect to see a case anytime. We all need to do our part to reduce the spread and keep Nova Scotians healthy and safe. I believe Nova Scotians, like everyone around the world, understand that this virus is impacting our daily lives, whether we are infected or not. We need to work together, remain calm, but deliberate, and take the steps necessary to slow the spread. For all of us, it is important to continue to follow the proper hygiene practices, monitor how we're feeling, and follow the screening protocols that are available at 811. We have more than doubled the number of phone lines at 811 to manage the increased volume of calls. And there is now a new self-assessment tool on the 811 website where people can answer a few questions to determine if they should call 811. Today we are also introducing new measures. All public sector employees, including health, workers, teachers, civil servants who travel outside of Canada are required to self-isolate for 14 days when they get home. Isolated employees who can work from home must. This decision also applies to students in our public school system who travel internationally as well as children in childcare. They are required to be self-isolated for 14 days before returning to the classroom. We are encouraging the private sector to take the same approach when it comes to their employees who travel outside of Canada. We are ramping up our virtual school online learning, focusing on essential curriculum to ensure grade 12s get what they need so they can graduate on time. As for public gatherings, we are encouraging organizations, community groups, and entertainment facilities to limit the gatherings to no more than 150 people, and we will continue to assess this situation. I have also been working with the federal government to delay the cruise ship season. My hope is that we will hear something soon from them today. We understand this decision will impact travel plans and productivity, but we believe it is necessary to continue to minimize the risk of the spread of COVID-19 infection here in Nova Scotia. We have also activated the EMO to work with our partners in the municipalities across the province to share information and be ready to support our municipal partners and community groups when necessary. Public health officials here and across the country have been working since January on a plan, prepare and implement appropriate actions to slow down the spread of COVID-19. And we are following their advice. I'd like to express my appreciation and that of all Nova Scotians to Dr. Strang and the team here at Public Health, who've been an outstanding job continuing to make sure that we have the information that required. And I'll ask Dr. Strang to say a few words. Thank you, Premier. Uh, as the Premier has said, we, don't, we do not have any cases of COVID-19 here in, in Nova Scotia yet. We fully expect that that will happen. We just have to look around the, uh, the world in the last couple of weeks. Significant spread in Europe. We're now seeing significant spread in the United States. We're now seeing increased activity in some of our provinces who already have it, British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario especially. So we know it is coming. Now is the time to take the actions that the Premier has outlined. It's, if we wait until it's here, it's too late. 
there is no uh, vaccine for this uh, virus. There is no d direct treatment on a specific antiviral. We are reliant on our public health measures to minimize the impact of COVID-19, to, to slow down the spread and protect our healthcare system and protect those who are susceptible to severe disease from this. So those public health measures include what we do as individuals. It's, they sound simple, but the measures of washing your hands frequently, avoiding touching your face, especially with unwashed hands, making sure we're cleaning down uh, surfaces, both in our homes and in, out in the public, where a lot of people ha people's hands go. Staying home if you're sick, with, with, especially with fever or cough. All of those are critically important because the way this virus is spread. Uh, and so they're essential that we're all doing those uh, collectively. We know that if there's a good uh, adherence to those measures in communities, we can decrease the transmission of this virus b between 30 to 50 percent. That means way less Nova Scotians being affected. It means less people needing, needing health care. It's especially important that we pay attention to those who are most vulnerable, uh, at highest risk for uh, severe disease. And those are, those are people who are elderly, people over 65, especially people in long-term care facilities, also people with chronic conditions and, and people who are immune suppressed. So it's incumbent upon all of us as Nova Scotians to take these steps, to, uh, and, and especially because we're doing it not so much for ourselves, but to protect those who are more vulnerable in our communities. Another, the other piece of, of, of our public health measures is, is social distancing. So how do we keep people away from each other so there's not that a chance to spread the disease? That is why we're saying people who are traveling uh, in the public sector who have been traveling internationally, they need to self-isolate when they come back for 14 days, minimize the chance of them bringing the virus back and then spreading it uh, in Nova Scotia. We're also asking those who in the, in the private sector to do the same. A again, and along with that, we're asking people to minimize, so do not have gatherings more than 150 people. It's when we get large numbers of people coming together, whether it's a private function, whether it's uh, a sporting event, uh, whether it's a conference, we we're seeing those are where the virus can really uh, take hold and spread. We will look at that, we're asking people today uh, to, to look at those practices. We're going to be assessing that, and as, as time moves on, all of the measures, we may become more directive on that as necessary. This is all about minimizing, you've heard the term flattening the curve. It's, it's flattening the curve out, slowing things down, and that will impact the decreasing the number of Nova Scotians, especially vulnerable Nova Scotians who get infected, will also make sure that we're doing everything we can do to uh, maintain the capacity of our healthcare system to care for people, both when they need care for COVID and when they, all the other healthcare needs that are, are present today. Uh, I'm gonna make one last comment and I'll turn it over to uh, Minister Delory. We know that there's a lot of pressures on 811 uh, they are rapidly uh, changing those, but a, a plea to Nova Scotians, if you're looking just for information around COVID disease, we have a website, the federal government has a 1-800 number, do not phone 811 unless you have traveled outside of the country and have developed fever or new cough. We need to make sure 811 is used for when it's needed and I've heard reports this morning of media are calling 811 just to see what the wait time is. Do not do that, that's inappropriate, I'm sorry, but we need to, this is a time for people to act appropriately and use the resources we have only when they're necessary. And thank you, Dr. Strang. I, I want to uh, assure everybody, as the Premier already acknowledged, uh, the work of, of Dr. Strang and his team within uh, public health, but there are many, many other people uh, throughout uh, the Department of Health and our partner health organizations at the Nova Scotia Health Authority and the IWK, 
uh, and, and throughout uh, the provincial government that have come together. Uh, certainly public health, uh, given the nature of the situation, are the lead uh, with the expertise, um, but they need our support uh, as well. And uh, teams have, have come together to provide that support. Uh, as the uh, announcement today illustrates, the actions that uh, are being taken uh, expand to many sectors of, of government and the, the public service. Uh, and so all departments are really uh, working together in response to keep Nova Scotians safe. And I want to echo the Premier's uh, thanks and appreciation. Uh, there are a lot of people who work on behalf of Nova Scotians each and every day, but in a situation like this, uh, they are working extra long hours uh, to ensure that we stay up to date on a, on a rapidly evolving uh, situation, uh, to assess the risks here in Nova Scotia, to provide advice and recommendations to government uh, as to what actions to take place. And there's been a lot of work that has gone into preparing uh, the announcement today, and as Dr. Strang highlighted, uh, this work will continue because the situation uh, continues to evolve. Uh, further, I would like to also uh, pick up on, on Dr. Strang's uh, reference uh, about 811 uh, and broadly about information. Uh, we need to use our health resources, including the 811 system, uh, appropriately to ensure that our health care providers uh, throughout the entire system uh, are able to uh, continue to do what, what they do best and, and provide care to Nova Scotians. And whether it's responding to the uh, inevitable uh, case of COVID-19 uh, or uh, responding to the existing uh, health uh, needs of our, our citizens. But I'd also like to pick up on uh, some instances where people, whether Nova Scotians or others, and misinformation that's being spread uh, at times online, in particular through social media, including one incident that took place yesterday where someone was actually emulating um, or attempting to emulate uh, an existing news provider uh, within the province to um, present false information, including uh, representing a quote from me as the health minister. So I encourage Nova Scotians, if you see information online, through social media or rumours uh, that take place, don't spread that information. Follow up. We have information, our website at novascotia.ca coronavirus, our 811 website, uh, do provide information. We, as a, as a province, will continue to keep media and the public informed of the most uh, accurate information. So again, please don't spread misinformation and take the appropriate uh, cautions with both your, 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 your physical health uh, and, of course, with the information in the situation. Thank you. We'll be happy to answer any questions. Wondered uh, whether, and I don't know who is best equipped to answer this question. Do we have any idea how many public sector workers might have plans to leave the province and come back? Uh, we've gone through uh, both education uh, and health. Uh, that is changing rapidly. Some people are making the decision already to change their plans. So uh, it could be as high as 4,000. Uh, but uh, we won't know that until we get more into the weekend and, and this week. And what plans have been made to ensure if thousands of uh, public sector workers, particularly in critical service areas uh, such as hospitals or long-term care facilities, um, that you have uh, replacement workers who are going to be able to uh, fill in during their self-isolation? Uh, so we've worked with our partners across the province, uh, whether it's long-term care or whether it's the, the health authority or the education uh, centers across the province to identify the numbers. Uh, we uh, believe there are, uh, we have the capacity to do this, but this is really about public health. Uh, it is about ensuring uh, that if uh, someone has uh, left this country, gone to Europe, to the United States, so where this virus is moving quickly, uh, that it is not brought back un unknowingly in some cases and distributed through our health care system. Uh, so it really is about public health uh, and we're ramping up to ensure that we have the, the appropriate staff levels to be able to deliver the services uh, that we have responsibility to do. Premier, the, uh, have other the number of cases, oh, sorry, the number of tests rather. If you ask, I'm, I'm going to look that up. If you ask another question, I'll come back to you. Why are the, uh, the schools in Ontario are being closed? Why isn't that happening here? 
Well, we, uh, the, the issue for us is we need to ensure that when schools were open, that the, uh, that the isolation period would have happened. So if we close schools for uh, an extra two weeks, there's no, no guarantee that uh, those kids will be back in Nova Scotia two weeks prior to the school's opening. They could extend their vacations. Could be, uh, could be any number of reasons why they might not have been able to isolate away from the virus. That's the issue for us. Uh, and bearing in mind, uh, the, the vast majority of Nova Scotians are not traveling. The vast majority of kids are not traveling. Uh, we want to ensure that we continue with their education uh, and provide that in a safe environment. And those Nova Scotians who choose to take their children uh, out, of the, out of the country, uh, part of that uh, will be that they will re be required to be isolated for 14 days prior to coming into our public schools. About universities and colleges what do you recommend there so we're working now with our sister organizations we bo we believe as we do with the private sector they should be following these protocols that if uh, uh, if their students have left uh, the country uh, they should go into isolation as well uh, and the same thing for faculty if faculty is leaving the country and come back or or guest faculty coming in uh, we need to uh, make sure they're isolated for for the 14 day period um, we got information from uh, that the doctors in the province were asked not to leave the province. Is that true? I'm, I'm not aware of any uh, any uh, request. I think there was a there. Um, what I am aware of is that the Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, is is putting a directive, and we've done in the government about non-essential travel. That's more to uh, keep people at home doing the work we need to do uh, around that. But I'm not aware of a directive to to any any group that's saying you sh you should not travel. I think a lot of people are making that decision for themselves. I'm just going to ask your uh, come back question. We've had 226. Uh, lab results come back all negative at this point in time. Looking at the 811, you're saying it's being bombarded right now. Is there anything else that can be done to, like you said, there's these um, self diagnosing tools you can kind of look at online? Any other measures that we're looking at to kind of help this? the system which seems inundated so we doubled the number of lines uh, yesterday roughly from the 40s to over 90 we'll continue to increase the number of lines as required in Quebec, but i i don't want to there, there, i i do want to make sure those nova scotians that can access the website uh, do so and and use the self diagnosed tool that is there is that a new measure sorry is the website is that that, that was stood up just in the last uh, one to two days in a self assessment tool but i think it's important that we we have uh, uh, we, like everything, we have a certain capacity within our labs. So it's important that we funnel people, people through some system that we're only testing those who really needed to be tested. And the most logical way to do that, to keep people at home as much as we can and then direct them in as necessary was 811. So we're rapidly building that capacity uh, around that. So what is your advice to non-public sector workers who leave the province? My advice to them uh, would be to self-isolate, to do the exact same thing. Uh, this is a public health issue. I, I don't think we can stress enough uh, the severity of this virus as it is going around the world. Uh, if you look at where, where massive outbreaks have happened, it's become citizens have not, and partially citizens have not understood the severity of this and felt like they've had the flu or a cold and continued to go to work and spread it rapidly. Uh, it is all incumbent on all of us to look out for one another. Uh, it is irresponsible for any of us uh, if we've gone to a place where this virus has been and come home and not isolate ourselves to protect our fellow citizens. Uh, we have the responsibility as a government when it comes to the public service, but each of us individually have a responsibility for one another. And if it's critical for you to venture into that travel, then you need to show us the courtesy when you come home to self-isolate. This virus is coming. How are we going to slow down the spread so we can deal with it appropriately? This is what this is about. It's what Dr. Strang has been saying for weeks. And these measures are about that. And we expect citizens, whether you're in the public sector or private sector, to follow these protocols. You had mentioned that uh, you were uh, asking people or events that would have 150 people uh, in at a time to um, rethink that. I would hazard to guess that most bars on a Saturday night in Halifax have more than 100 people. What's your advice to them? We'll be, uh, I would encourage them uh, to follow the protocol. Uh, and we will be assessing this. Uh, so let me be clear, we will be assessing this to the private sector. Uh, we expect people to follow the appropriate protocol. This is about public health. 
Uh, you know, we don't want to impact your business. We don't want to impact people's routines. But the reality is we have a responsibility to care for one another, and that's what this is about. Uh, we, will, we will reassess this in the, coming, in the, the following week as I, Dr. Strang and his team have been doing uh, uh, daily calls with their colleagues across the country. Uh, and we will be looking for best practices, but we will be doing everything possible in our province to ensure when this gets here, we have done the due diligence to prevent the spread uh, at the rate it has happened in other places. Can I, we'll take can two I, more questions before we go to the phone lines. Dr. Go Strang, ahead. Dr. Dr. Strang. So I think we're, we're, you're seeing some other provinces being more directive, but they're the provinces that have more disease activity. Today, it is, to me, it's the entirely appropriate measure given we do not have any disease today. All of these measures we fully recognize have significant impacts on families, on businesses, et cetera. So it's all about finding the, the balance. Protecting people's health is, is important, but what's the balance of the impacts? Today, it's, it, we're, ask, we're asking people. But if, if, if we're, if we're, as things evolve and the disease ramps up even in, in, in North America and in Canada, and we're also, if we're seeing significant challenges of still with mass gatherings, we may well move uh, in, 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 in the near future to be more directive under the Health Protection Act. And I just want to emphasize the directive we're giving about people returning uh, public sector workers coming back. That is a directive ultimately under the Health Protection Act Did to protect people's health. Did the case come through Halifax Airport? I, I, we haven't been informed uh, by, on, by New Brunswick on that travel, so I'm assuming that not. Otherwise, it, we would have been notified. We'll go to global. We'll talk about international travel and self-isolating after that, but what about people who are traveling, say, to Toronto, Alberta, BC, where we've seen a higher number of cases? So we're, even though we're seeing a number of cases and there, there's been a conference and, and in, in Ontario, a couple of long-term care outbreaks in British Columbia, we are not yet seeing what I call broader community spread, even in those provinces that has significant numbers. That's the trigger. If we really start to see that broader community spread, we are we uh, we discussed this daily amongst my public health colleagues. We may have to start to put some travel restrictions on travel within Canada. This is all evolving. Dr. Strang, will you be reporting presumed cases or only confirmed cases if there are positive results? So we do not yet have capacity at the lab, uh, our lab here locally, to, con to, uh, to uh, it's not being validated yet, it's coming soon, that we w that's reliable enough to report a positive result from our lab. It still has to go to the national lab. Uh, so we do, at this point in time, we would only be reporting a case when it's confirmed from the national lab. Once we get the final validation of our lab, we would then be able to report a presumptive case because we, we, we're, we're, we will be confident enough on our results in our lab. And it, it would still have to be confirmed uh, at the national lab in Winnipeg. We're not quite there yet. Can you just go back to cruise ships. You've had discussions. What what have they looked like so far, I guess? Well, we're working with our uh, with the national government to have a national policy. Uh, as you know, uh, many of the ports are, are federally regulated, uh, and it wouldn't make a lot of sense for one port to shut down and have a, uh, you know, a port in a sister province working. So uh, the national, we're, our encouragement to the national government was to delay cruise ship season until we get a sense of what this looks like uh, as this starts, uh, uh, and we're hoping to hear back from them today. We've been in constant consultation with them. Any time period that you're looking at, or still being discussed? No, it, it would be a delay. It would be it would be months, but it wouldn't be uh, you know you were, it would be a, it would be an appropriate time level to give uh, public health a chance to look at it. I mean, uh, let's be you know what what we we have to deal with this issue. What happens if we have the, the virus on a cruise ship that lands in our port? Uh, the last thing we need to do is put added stress onto a system uh, that we're currently working hard to ensure that we can deal with it when it arrives, the way that we believe it will uh, through one of our citizens. This is a directive, as Dr. Strang has said, for public sector employees. Will they be paid while they're in self-isolation? Yes. Ross, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, it's kind of a multi-part, but it's sort of frontline, so I don't know if Dr. watson Creed maybe could chime in on this one, but um, are they using N95 masks in hospitals? Okay.
happy to speak to that. Yeah, so I, I will I will speak to this a bit. And so from my position in, in public health, I can only give you a, my sense of what is happening on those front lines uh, in hospital. Um, N95s are available in the hospitals, but to be clear, N95s are used for what we call aerosol generating procedures. So procedures where there is a high risk of somebody actually putting lots of small droplets into the air from whatever's happening. And intubation would be a good example of that type of procedure. This particular virus, so airborne uh, viruses is the other uh, time that we would use N95 respirators. And so, for example, um, measles as an example or tuberculosis. This particular virus, though, the coronavirus that we're talking about, is actually a droplet spread virus. This makes it more uh, in the category of, for example, the bacteria that cause meningitis. And so for that reason, N95s are not recommended to be used for coronavirus. We, uh, and so the hospitals are using appropriately surgical masks for that eventuality. But they do have N95s available to them should they have a coronavirus patient, for example, where they're doing that type of aerosol generating procedure. How many of those that you are using do you have and are, is it enough? That information I, I don't have. That would be a logistics uh, uh, question for the health authorities. How much capacity is there currently in our hospitals? Are they full or are they, where are they at? Well, uh, as you can imagine, the, uh, and I'm assuming uh, the question relates to bed capacity in, inside of the hospitals, that would change uh, every day. Certainly uh, on an ongoing basis, it's uh, upwards of 90%, uh, I believe, uh, capacity. But again, each, each hospital would vary in, in communities across the province, uh, and that varies uh, through time of year. For example, uh, peaks flu season, it's, it's usually higher. We're, we're on the downward uh, side of, of that uh, flu season now. Uh, so. Uh, uh, again, it, it varies, but uh, usually uh, upwards of 90 percent. Can you talk a little bit, because you were a little cryptic, about this fake newscast that had quotes from you? Uh, so, so it wasn't a newscast. It was a, a post online uh, where they uh, photoshopped uh, the um, headers of a, a particular uh, news organization and um, and included the text. It would look like a, a social media post from a news outlet, um, but photoshopped, uh, and that included text uh, that was attributed to me as the health minister. Um, not sure of the source. I will acknowledge that the news organization, uh, when they became aware, uh, did post themselves uh, to clarify the uh, illegitimacy of that. But again, it uh, it is in the same vein as people who share uh, perhaps unwittingly uh, information about rumors uh, that they hear about uh, infected people in certain communities and, and so forth. Uh, it's all of that information that should be validated. And as Dr. Uh, Strang has previously uh, responded to the media, um, information about confirmed cases will come from uh, public health, from the government. Uh, that information we post on our website, that is where people should go to verify their information before they start spreading it online. We'll take one more question before we go to the phone. Go ahead, John. Dr. Strain, you said uh, you're asking people to do this, but you have power under the... Uh, health Protection Act. What is that? How, can you talk about broadly what that power could extend to? So that, that power g gives uh, myself, in, uh, with uh, approval from the Premier and the, and the Minister of Health, uh, a broad, frankly, power, you know, that we can direct activities, all focused on, on, on things that, were, that are going to prevent the spread of, of a disease. So what we're saying to people today is that it's appropriate today where we're at with the, the COVID-19 that we are asking people. Uh, and we are being directed around the public sector people, but we certainly have the ability under the powers of the Health Protection Act to actually o order. So, for instance, we could at some point order that gatherings over whatever size we choose are no longer allowed. We'll go to the phone lines now. We will take three questions from the phones before we come back to the room. Does anyone on the, on the phone have a question? And please identify who you are and uh, who your question is for. Timothy Gillespie, Mark, South here from uh, Pugwash. One at a time. Go ahead, Timothy. Uh, the, um, I, I noticed that the Premier uh, had said that, uh, talked about the courtesy of people uh, self-isolating after they've returned. Uh, I'm getting reports that a small group of people from, I'm down here in Shelburne County, uh, spent uh, some considerable time in the, 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 the pocket in northern Italy that is m most uh, virulent uh, in the, in the uh, really tragic spread of the disease there. They've returned back to Nova Scotia, and uh, the reports that I'm getting is that they may not be self-isolating. And I'm wondering, is there, is there 
any provision that the government uh, has that they can uh, contact uh, people and insist that they self-isolate? Is there is there uh, any anybody who's to, to whom it can be reported? Yeah, so it's Dr. Strang. We actually, uh, travelers returning from Italy uh, now are, are given information by Canada Border Service agencies uh, because they've been in a, what we call a, a, a level three uh, country. So there, uh, we're, uh, there's now a federal advisory that uh, non-essential travel is not advised. When they come back, they're given, they're told, uh, they have, everybody has to identify where they've traveled. If they're Italy or Iran or Hubei province in China, if you identify those, you're told you now have to self-isolate. You're given a piece of paper that explains that to you. Con your contact information is obtained by Canada Border Service Agency. It comes to my office. I then send that out to local public health who then reach out to those individuals and, and to ensure that they are actually self-isolating and, 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 and figuring out what supports they need to maintain that self-isolation. So we have steps in place for those travelers to, uh, to monitor their self-isolation. Uh, if, if there are concerns around a specific group that are, aren't adhering to that, specific concerns, you should contact your local public health office and provide those specific details, and we will we will uh, be investigating and looking into that. Timothy, did Thank you, you very much. Timothy, did you have a follow-up? Uh, I don't. Thanks. Great. Uh, Mark, you're next. Bill Martin here, too, in Pugwash. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, given the uh, shortage of doctors, particularly in rural Nova Scotia, and the impact of closures on small community hospitals, uh, the Pugwash facility, for example, will be closed four days out of the next seven. Is there any special strategy to deal with rural situations and where or how people can, can uh, uh, find services as required? Uh, thank you uh, for the question. I think the uh, strategy of uh, providing and ensuring that uh, health services continue to be offered uh, in communities across the province uh, is the same uh, that we've been undertaking. Um, that is, uh, recruitment efforts uh, continue. Uh, we work with our health care system and, and frontline providers uh, to fill any vacancies uh, through uh, what's called a locum uh, program. Um, and certainly as the uh, situation e evolves, uh, uh, we are continuing our, our work uh, should demand um, and availability of, of health care professionals uh, vary, uh, again, to come together collectively, just like we're asking all Nova Scotians to come together. Uh, we certainly uh, working with our frontline health care providers to help ensure that uh, we have, have resources allocated appropriately. Martin, did you have a follow-up? I understand that you're taking steps to try and provide those rural services, but my question is more about what happens to a patient uh, who is in a community such as Parsboro, Spring Hill, Pugwash, where the emergency department is closed. Uh, are they to uh, follow the 811 protocol and drive all the way to Amherst? Uh, Martin, they are to call 811, and the health care provider on 811 will direct them to the appropriate place uh, to provide their testing. One of the things that uh, Dr. Strang has been very clear about, uh, going directly to emergency room is not the appropriate step, uh, whether it's open, uh, whether you're next to it or not. Uh, you call 811 and the healthcare provider will direct you to the appropriate place. Uh, because if you do have, uh, if you test positive, we want to make sure you isolate it. That's the important step. So if you could communicate to all those people that you're referring to, uh, call 811. We'll go back to the phone lines for one more question. Um, well, McClernand here from the North. One question. Go ahead. Okay. Um, with the increasing global shortage of uh, hand sanitizer, what are the positive and negative implications for Nova Scotians that are making their own? So I'm I, I'm not aware about anything around making your own hand san hand sanitizer. I will make the comment though that the preferred approach that if you have e access to it is is water and and, and soap. That is more effective at cleaning your hands than hand sanitizer. So hand sanitizer should only be a, a, as a backup for when you don't have ready access to water and soap. Thank you very much. That's all the time we have for the phone lines. We'll come back to the room for two questions. Go ahead, Brett Ruskin. With the 150 person limit to gatherings, doesn't that effectively close the schools in a week? Uh, after
would they come back on March break? No, what it would prevent would be uh, the school gathering and like in the gymnasium, or whatever. When you go into a school, there it's all divided into classrooms. So there's we have class caps. In some cases, they're as low as 20. Other cases, they're up 30. But no, it wouldn't. What we would prevent would be you know the the, the school-based gathering, concerts, all of those things that would not be allowed uh, to happen. Well, many of them in lots of our schools are in, in classrooms and, they're, and they'd be split shifts. We'd find a way to deal with it. Uh, but yeah, no, it wouldn't be, there would definitely, we would be able to, to isolate that we would not have that in, in our school. Recess? Well, those kids are outdoors. Uh, so they would be out in the, in the community, but in, in the round, in surrounding. And if they're inside, they would be isolated to their particular classrooms. I understand that a lot of teachers and students aren't traveling now, but obviously still some that are traveling outside Canada. What happens if there's more than you're expecting? Like if we're looking at staff shortages when it comes to even substitutes that might have traveled outside, what, what can we do in that regard? Uh, so we'll assess that. Uh, they will have to isolate. Uh, self-isolate for 14 days so all uh, other activity with inside the school system so p days all of those other committees that were set up are all being uh, shut down they will not be taking place so people will not be traveling out of their school to to attend different functions or different meetings uh, all of the people in central offices will also their activity will be directly focused towards ensuring that we have people standing in front of our kids uh, in schools across the province so uh, we're working today uh, with uh, with the department and our colleagues across the province uh, to make sure that we can deal with the very potential shortage that we know will exist because there uh, it is one of the sectors where because it's, it, is, it is a committed break for teachers unlike other sectors where we can take our vacation at different times this is one of the few times they can know for certain that they'll be off we know some of them will be out of the province and when they come home they have to, to uh, self-isolate so that means the current ones that are here whether they're actively in classrooms today or whether they're subbing or whether they're in board offices, uh, potentially would be called on to work in classrooms uh, for that uh, isolation period of 14 days. One more quick one on this. Who do they, do they have to report it to the principal? Do they have to report it to the department? If they travel outside, how does that work? So that what would happen is a typical line of command would be through the school administration, which would be the principal, vice principals, which would work through the central offices into the deputy minister. We have time and that information has been gathered now, being gathered now. So we have time for two more questions. Dr. Go ahead, Stern, Jean, and then Rob. Why does it uh, seem that health officials across Canada are diverging in their uh, approach to whether to close schools or not? You have Ontario saying, yes, we're going to do this. You're saying no. We're hearing that other provinces might follow their lead. Um, obviously, others are not. What, what, what is this divergence, and can you talk to what might be behind that? So I think it's a couple of things. So no, the, 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 the level of the disease is, is differs between province and province, and, and the strength of, uh, of, of your public health measures, therefore, needs to be, uh, will, will be differ. Uh, as, as I said, it's the appropriate balance of public health measures and, 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 and not creating uh, unnecessary social disruption. Um, also, there's a lot of other factors that go into whether you close a, a school or not. So, uh, and, and each each jurisdiction will weighs up those factors and comes comes to a conclusion. We may end up there. We're not there yet, and I don't think that's necessary yet, as you've heard from the premier. But we're, that's certainly something that we will continue to actively look at, and whether that would be necessary in Nova Scotia. Last question to Sean. Those critical services uh, that the government provides, uh, child welfare. Um, child protection, um, uh, community services. How will you ensure that those services continue to run properly if you have a certain percentage of your uh, staff go down or self-isolate for two well, weeks? Well, there's, there's uh, measures being taken now by the minister to ensure uh, as much of, uh, not only outside of whether uh, staff issue, but quite frankly, the clients. Uh, if we have families that have been f forced into isolation that we're able to provide them quickly with some support financially and, and to ensure that they have the necessities uh, to be able to go through that uh, um, uh, 14 days self-isolation. Uh, she's working now through that process. Uh, we're also out in community working with our existing partners to help us provide support. So for example, today they would be reaching out to all food banks across the province. If there's an outbreak in a particular community, how do we make sure we put the right protocols that we can provide uh, that support? Uh, and we as a government would be there financially to help support uh, uh, where necessary. But at this point, as uh, we're fortunate that, that we have, uh, there is no uh, 
COVID-19 positive test here, uh, but the protocols inside government uh, are continuing to work and taking the directive from public health. I just make a comment on that too. So within government, there's also a business continuity process, which is in place for all types of events and emergencies. And that is always focused on what are the critical services you need to maintain and how do you direct resources to maintain those, those critical services. So that's an ongoing process in government. And we're also working with, uh, with through Emergency Me Measures Office for critical infrastructure groups. How do they have the appropriate business continuity in place as well to preserve their services? That's all part of a pandemic plan that we're turning to. So the critical infrastructure inside and outside of government is maintained in the event that we have large numbers of people who are off ill. Can you just define critical infrastructure that would be what? Uh, emerge, so things like Nova Scotia Power, uh, our telephone system, et cetera. There's a whole group that deals with this on a regular basis. So government has a good handle on this business continuity planning, in the, in the, which is in place for a whole range of emergencies. I just want to close with this. I said this to all of you uh, when Durian hit, uh, how grateful I was as government and we were as Nova Scotians for the cooperation that we had in providing the appropriate information consistently updated uh, constantly. I can only ask you uh, again, this is an important part that we're all in this together. Uh, public health has been doing a tremendous job. We require you uh, to help us communicate to Nova Scotians the facts uh, about how they can best protect themselves, uh, why it's critical for someone who's been away in an area to self-isolate. Uh, it's the best thing they can do for their neighbour. Uh, is to ensure that they self-isolate when they come home so they can protect their neighbour and their community. Uh, and it, I want us to, to be the province in Canada uh, that has actually made sure that we dealt with this the most professional way and the best way uh, collectively. Uh, so your role in this is critical. Uh, so we look forward, uh, Dr. Strang looks forward uh, to continuing to be the public face of this for us and I look forward to being with him to help continue to communicate to Nova Scotians uh, that we're doing everything possible uh, to ensure their protection. Uh, and these steps weren't made lightly, they were made with all of us in mind. So thank you all. Thanks for joining us this morning.